So without further ado, I'm going to invite our first presenter, Dr. Angela Mashford Pringle. And Angela, sorry your picture is not on there. Tech challenges today, but we'll make it work. Um, so I'm um, Dr. Angela Mashford Pringle, as I mentioned, is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. And before Angela starts, I'd just like to, um, she has a question for you all, which we'll put up the screen. But Angela is going to be speaking to two questions. Angela is going to be sharing her thoughts on how can indigenous knowledge guide us in these uncertain times, and also share an experience on what pandemic planning with First Nations looks like. So we'll ask each of our presenters to speak for about five minutes. After that, our presenters will have a an opportunity to really respond to each other, after which we will take questions in the Q&A. So I'm going to encourage you all to also respond to these questions. So while Angela is sharing her thoughts about these two questions, please also respond to these questions in the chat box. Thank you. Angela, on to you. Kwe Kwe, Ani, Bozo, Penzi. Uh, my name is Angela Mashburg Pringle. I'm from Temiskaming First Nation in northern Quebec, but I was born and raised in Toronto. I'm the associate director for the Wakab and S. Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health and an assistant professor at Dalwana School of Public Health. Um, I'm currently watching everything that's going on in our world and thinking, wow, we do have a lot of knowledge in First Nations and that could potentially help. And when I say that, I'm not saying that we have the answers, but you know, many of our teachings talk about how to be how everything is interconnected. So when you start to look at pandemics like COVID-19, you start to understand that, you know, uh, it's not just human beings in this world, that the plants, the animals, the birds, the fish, the land, the soil, the water, it's all connected. So as you know, we start to heal Mother Earth, um, we can start to heal people as well. And I'm not saying it's going to fix COVID, but it will definitely help us in future because that would help with climate change, which could help to reduce some of the um, diseases that we're seeing come up because they're coming up because we're not taking care of what's out there with us. So I wanted to, to make mention of that. And uh, one of the things that I have been a strong advocate for is that everything should have personhood rights. We shouldn't be making humans the top of a pyramid and being the uh, be-all, end-all of everything that's you know in the world uh, because we need everything else to survive. So if there weren't plants or there weren't animals or there weren't birds or fish, we as humans wouldn't make it. We have to be careful that we're paying attention to that and that we're taking care of everything. And that's part of traditional teaching. And we look very holistically. So we always try to think of the individual, the family, the community, the nation. And obviously, at this time, everybody's doing that too. But that's not what we normally see in everyday life. And I think that change to having to look at those four components has made people a little scared. So I'm thinking that if we could start thinking about how Indigenous people view the world, it may be helpful as well. Um, we have lots of ceremonies. And, and if you're on any social media, you'll know that we've had calls for ceremonies to happen. For example, uh, I think it was two weeks ago, we were calling for jingle dancers to go out and do their uh, dancing outside to help heal the earth and send positive vibes into the to, to creator to you know help out with what's going on. Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean that I expect non-Indigenous people to, to do any of these things, but I really hope that they will start to see that there are different ways of knowing and different ways of being that we haven't actually tapped into or that we've forgotten, because I don't think just First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people in Canada have these knowledges, and I think that we tend to um, put them aside until it's of help to somebody else or it's uh, economically beneficial. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I do want to remind you that we have um, uh, seven grandfather teachings, and they are respect, love, truth, bravery, wisdom, honesty, and humility. 
And why do I tell you this? Well, because I think that it's important for us to think of this pandemic as a time that we can start to show respect. So it's the way you speak to people, the way you interact with people. Uh, love, showing that you not only love other people, but the environment and the plants, the animals, and everything. And truth, we, we are acting in a way that we believe is the truth. It's the best way forward. We're brave in that we're showing what needs to be done and working towards it in a good way. We have wisdom, which means we have intelligence, and we're trying to use that intelligence and the, the past learnings that we have in order to you know, move us forward. And honesty, so going uh, the right way and, and trying to be on the right side of everything um, would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, as you know, right now we need people to stay home and, and to not try to um, infect others, so that's you know, doing that. And humility, just you know, making sure that you check yourself at the door and that you're not trying to say that you know or are more than you are. So with that all being said, um, I'm going to move into the second question because I, I think we could have a long conversation about Indigenous knowledges and it would be good to have a, a knowledge keeper and or an elder with us to do that. Um, so now I would like to talk a little bit about what pandemic planning talk, uh, looks like for First Nations uh, in Canada right now. Now I'm not the uh, expert, but I am working with Anishinaabe Aski Nation, uh, which is here in Ontario. It's most of the northern Ontario communities, uh, First Nations communities. Some are remote, some are rural. And so uh, I'm personally working with their child welfare agencies to figure out what does protocol look like. But I can tell you some of the issues that we've had in past with H1N1 and with SARS and other pandemics has been and still continues to be the issues that we have today when we're trying to do this pandemic planning for COVID, which is we have inadequate housing. So, you know, speaking to elders and other community members over the last week, we can have up to 18 people in one house. There's no way to social isolate. There is no way to, um, you know, distance because you have 18 people in a house. So it's very difficult to do that. Um, and the, un the other... Uh, problem is a lot of the houses aren't arranged in such a way that you ha don't have things like black mold. Um, so again, there's already, you're creating a deficit for people. Uh, out of the 49 communities in NAN territory, at least from what I gathered from the elder yesterday, was 35 of them are on boil advisories or do not consume, which means when I talk about water, water is a huge issue. If you don't have clean water, you can't wash your hands, which is what they're telling everybody to do. So we have to be careful that we um, are not giving advice and, and telling people, hey, you know, this is the way to, to stop the pandemic. So again, I think that it's important that we talk about that. And the fact that the government has said that they're going to, to work on water, but yet it hasn't happened. Um, it's slow, it's trickle effect. While we're seeing in Toronto and, and other cities that you know you can have places to self-isolate, and I'm sure uh, one of the other presenters may be talking about homelessness, but we don't have that in, in many of our communities. So this is a huge issue if you can't wash your hands, if you can't get away from people. Um, the other big thing that has happened in almost every instance when we talk about health is we don't have enough personal protective equipment for our, our staff that are in communities, whether that be frontline healthcare workers or in child welfare. And often people don't think about that. Um, and we need to be thinking about that. We also have a low number of healthcare professionals that are in community. So if you did get COVID uh, and you needed to be on our uh, ventilator, the chances of you being able to be on that ventilator would be small. Um, there wouldn't be enough. There probably wouldn't be somebody that could actually look after that. So again, I, I think that we have to be cognizant of what's available to treat this. And so while I'm saying that, part of the planning that I've heard uh, for, from some communities uh, is that they try to work around those barriers and challenges by putting up barricades, not letting people into community. While that doesn't seem like a great thing, um, it is a great thing because if we can't 
self-isolate in our homes, then the next best thing is to keep people who might potentially be um, asymptomatic but carriers out of the communities. So you'll hear a lot of, uh, if you go on social media, you'll hear a lot about the fact that there are some First Nations communities who have put up actual barricades and are asking people about uh, why they're coming or, or going from the First Nation. And I think that's really important. It helps to keep the, the virus out of the communities who can't actually work with it right now. Um, next, I, you know, as part of that, though, the other thing is we still have to have uh, some goods and services moving, so that means you still have people coming and going from the community, and that's still a risk for them. Um, and yes, there is, so I, I can see that there are people that are currently working on Indigenous or with Indigenous communities on, on COVID planning, and I hope that, you know, um, there's a way that we can continue con to connect and that we can connect to each other because I think all the communities are, are running and trying to get as much resourcing done as possible. Um, it's important, though, that we work together because all of our First Nations are going to be in dire need of help if this actually fits into uh, their, gets into their communities. Somebody just asked something about floods, and I just want to mention that, yes, this is also a big issue, is the fact that we're under spring thaw and flooding will be a huge uh, problem and will continue to be a problem. But that's not the only problem we're facing at the moment. The other problem that we're facing is the fact that there are still things going on that are harmful for First Nations people. So, for example, many of you have heard about uh, the wet Wet'suwet'en peoples in BC and the Coastal Gas Link pipeline. And in fa all fairness, it's still going forward even though we're all in lockdown. Our government has allowed anything that to do with gas and oil to keep moving, and if you read anything about Alberta, you will notice that they're not stopping it either. Now, this is problematic for a number of reasons, one of which is you have what they call man camps. It's a bunch of men, uh, and if you've heard anything about murdered and missing Indigenous women, this is a way that uh, could be very harmful and detrimental to our communities because they're not able to push these people out of their community so, uh, or away from the community at such a, a risk to their health and safety at this point. The second problem is it's not helping our environment. By continuing to have gas and mining, we are actually doing more harm to our environment than good. Uh, with the way that gas prices and oil prices are right now, it's probably not to our advantage as a, as a country to want to be pushing that. And then finally, virus transmission. By having people doing work on gas and oil in our communities, it's, in, it's going to be detrimental and it's likely that the virus will get into the communities if we don't stop it. So I'm going to leave it there and hand it back to Sune. Excellent. Thank you so much, Angela. I think as you're speaking, um, a couple of things just sort of uh, stand out for me. I think you're really making a compelling case that what, what we're seeing in this pandemic is that the inequities which all of us on the line know already exist are just being revealed and made so profoundly uh, I think we cannot deny. Uh, you spoke about the grandfather teachings and really that return to some really core teachings and values and using that to guide our work. And even some, some of the, the basic, what we consider basic public health response, which many communities are not able to do. I am from Cameroon, so as you're speaking, I'm just thinking about that, the global context, right, where in some places where you don't have access to clean drinking water, let alone water to wash your hands on a regular basis. <laughs> And so as we go into the discussion, I'll be interested in hearing from you and other, uh, other presenters and also for folks from folks on the line. What are the alternatives to those, to those messages? Like how do we turn some of those things on the, our, their heads in places where we know they're not even possible? So thank you, Angela, for that.